Thus far in our studies of limit, we have kind of been waving our hands over the definition of a limit and talking more generally about the definition rather than the precise definition. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. The question is, what is the precise definition of a limit? So first, we're going to look at the definition. And then we'll take a look at kind of the meat of this lesson, which is how do we show that a value actually is the limit of some type of function. So first, graphically, to get an idea of what we're going to be talking about here, let's say we've got uh, some graph. Maybe it curves up like this. And we want to know what is the limit of f of x as x approaches some number. Actually, let's call it a, not c. As x approaches a of f of x. Well, the way we actually define the derivative is we're going to say we're going to move from a out a little bit each direction. Because remember, our limit, we need both sides. That little tiny change that we move, we call delta. So we add delta and we subtract delta to get to two more spots. And the idea is if I go up to the point on the graph, what I can do is I can box in the actual point on the graph within that range. So the point on the graph in green here where A actually hits or where A should be, it might not actually be there, we're going to call that L, the limit. And the idea is that the deltas will box it in within some epsilon above or epsilon below. The challenge that we're going to have is to find the connection between the delta that we move left and right on the bottom and the epsilon that we move up and down from the right. And so the idea is if we zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and get closer and closer to the actual point, we'll continue to be boxed in around some epsilon. That box is what allows us to not actually have a point there, because we just have to be around the point. Basically, infinitely close to the point, but not actually at the point. What are we at? So for every epsilon, we need to be able to find a delta. And this is what gives rise to, in words, the precise definition for the limit. We say that for all epsilon, that's a Greek letter epsilon, greater than 0, that there exists a delta greater than 0, another Greek letter, such that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, remember a is that x coordinate that we want to find the limit at, then the absolute value, we do absolute value because we can do plus or minus, the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. In other words, on the right side, we're within an epsilon of the actual limit. Now, because mathematicians like to show off and make things more complicated than they really are, we actually can represent this entire definition symbolically. So uh, this is a neat party trick, is to just be able to write down really quick the precise definition of a limit without writing a single word. So here is symbolically the precise definition of a limit. This is a thing of beauty. The limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l 
implies that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta implies that the absolute value of f of x minus the limit is less than epsilon. So a great party trick is the precise definition of a limit. I enjoy putting this on the test for extra credit, but it is quite fancy looking. So what we really want to be able to do with this definition, though, is actually be able to take a limit and say, hey, if this is the limit, I can prove it's actually the limit by identifying this relationship between epsilon and delta. We call these our epsilon delta proofs. And every single proof looks identical. And so to help you set up your proofs, I'm going to show you the structure of the proof that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. You're going to do four steps. And three of the four steps are really scripted. And the fourth one is just a little bit of algebra that's actually quite easy. The first step is you're always going to say, we let epsilon be greater than 0. That has to be true. And that's always the same, every proof. Let epsilon be greater than 0. Then you'll say, choose a delta that is equal to something. And actually, we're going to find this later. And I should do that in a different color because it's not actually part of the proof. But usually, that something is going to have the epsilon in it because it's going to show the relationship between epsilon and delta. So just leave it blank temporarily because the next thing you do is you assume the absolute value of x minus a is less than the delta. And then you say the absolute value of f of x minus the limit is equal to, and then you do some algebra. And after some algebra, you're going to ultimately say that's less than something which is going to require you to do some more algebra. And that will ultimately equal epsilon. Move that arrow so it's a little nicer. Maybe make it blue. So every single proof is going to look exactly the same. The only place where you actually have to do any work is in this dot, dot, dot. And while you do that dot, dot, dot of algebra, it's going to tell you what you're ultimately going to put in back in step number two for that delta. And actually, steps one, two, and three we usually throw out on one line because they are so straightforward. So let's do a couple examples. I've got four examples of proofs, and then you can practice some on your own. First, let's do some linear examples. And just kind of as a tip, if we're dealing with a linear equation like y equals mx plus b, uh, with linear examples, the delta is generally equal to epsilon divided by something. And you have to figure out what that something is. So following that same structure, first we're going to prove that the limit as x approaches 3 of 4x minus 7 equals 5. Notice that 3 is the a, what x is approaching. 5 is the limit, or l. And the 4 minus 7, 4x minus 7, that's the function. So here's our proof. We always say, let epsilon be greater than 0. Choose a delta that's equal to something. 
We'll leave that blank. And then we will assume the absolute value of x minus a. a is the what the limit is approaching is less than delta. That part's really scripted. The only gap is we don't know what delta equals yet. We're going to go back and fill that in in a minute. Now we're going to take the absolute value of f of x minus l. Well, we, let's put f of x in there, actually. f of x is the function, 4x minus 7, and then subtract the limit, which is 5. And now we're going to play with this and do some algebra. What you might see immediately is we can combine like terms on the 7 and the 5. So we have the absolute value of 4x minus 12. And then what we ultimately want to do is we want to find some absolute value of x minus 3 so we can use what we assumed. And what you might see here is all we have to do is factor out the 4, and we get the absolute value of x minus 3. We know, we know that the absolute value of x minus 3 is less than delta, so we're ready to do our less than statement. It's less than 4 times the absolute value, which is less than delta. This is where we know now what we want epsilon to be, or what we want delta to be. Because what we ultimately want to do is when we multiply by 4, all that's left is epsilon. So delta then is going to be the reciprocal of what we're multiplying by. The reciprocal of 4 is 1 over 4. So delta is equal to epsilon over 4. And we stick that into the first line. That might not be very clear, but it becomes clear why that's useful in the very next step. Because now we have 4 times delta is equal to epsilon over 4. And now the 4s divide out, leaving just the epsilon. And if we're able to simplify the f of x minus l and say it is less than epsilon, we have proven that this limit is actually equal to what we said it was equal to. When we're done with a the proof, there's a couple ways we show that we're done in mathematics. Uh, the most common way is we write at the end QED. That's Latin for quid erum demonstratum. That was what we wished to show. Another thing I see a lot of times is people put a little box and color it in as if to check off that it's done. Another thing I've seen is W to the fifth, which is, stands for which was what we wanted. Somehow acknowledge, though, that you've gotten to the end of the proof. A QED is really nice because it looks like you know Latin and it looks smart. Let's do one more linear example so that we can see kind of how another similar problem works. But every problem kind of has the same general setup. For this example, we're going to prove that the limit as x goes to negative 1 of x squared plus 4x plus 3 over x plus 1 is equal to 2. And like before, identifying the pieces, what x is approaching, that's my a. What's inside the limit, that's the function. And the answer, that's my limit, l. The first line is pretty scripted of every delta epsilon proof. We let epsilon be greater than 0. We choose a delta that's equal to something. Leave some space. We'll come back. It's going to be the reciprocal of whatever we're multiplying delta by with an epsilon in the numerator. And then we will assume the absolute value of x minus a, which is negative 1, minus a negative 1 is the same as plus 1 is less than delta. Now the next line is where we do our algebra. We take the absolute value of the function, which is x squared plus 4x plus 3 over x plus 1, and subtract the limit of 2. 
And hopefully after massaging it a bit, we end up saying this is less than epsilon. Well, with rational expressions, we're really comfortable with factoring to reduce. So when we factor, we get x plus 3 times x plus 1 over the x plus 1, and we still have the minus 2 at the end. But this is really nice because the x plus 1s divide out, which leaves us with the absolute value of x plus 3 minus 2. And I'm going to run out of space on my next statement. So let's go ahead and use the next line and say equals uh, the absolute value combining like terms of x plus 1. And this is actually really nice because this already is the part that's less than delta. This time, we don't have to factor anything out. Just to keep things consistent, though, I'm going to factor out a 1 and say that's 1 times the absolute value because we know that delta has to be the reciprocal of that number times epsilon. Well, the reciprocal of 1 is just 1. So we have epsilon over 1, or just epsilon. Delta equals epsilon. Because now I know that the x plus 1 is less than the delta. That's from my assume statement. x plus 1 is less than the delta. And we know that the delta is equal to the epsilon, which is what we defined at the beginning. And QED, we have proven that this limit equals 2. So with linear examples, our general strategy as we work through the steps is to make delta equal to the reciprocal of whatever is multiplied by delta. But we can also do quadratic examples pretty nicely. So let's do a couple of those quadratic examples. With quadratics, what we're going to have to do is we're going to need a little bit of help to make delta come out right. And so we're going to actually give delta two options. Delta is always going to be equal to the minimum of 1 and epsilon divided by something. We need that 1 to kind of set up what the divided by something is. And I'll show you in just a minute. But with quadratics, when you see x squared, delta is going to be the minimum of 1 and the reciprocal, again, of what's being multiplied by delta. So let's see if we can prove that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3x is equal to negative 2. Again, x is approaching our a value. The function is what's inside the limit. And L, the limit, is the answer. And we start filling in our proof structure. First, we let epsilon be greater than 0. Then we choose a delta that's going to be equal to something we don't know yet. But we know with quadratics, we have to do the minimum of 1 and something. We don't know what the something is yet. And then we will assume that the absolute value of x minus 2, or our a that x is approaching, is less than delta. Then we go to that absolute value statement. The absolute value of our function, x squared minus 3x, minus the limit. Minus a negative 2 means plus 2. And hopefully, we'll work this down and ultimately say it's less than an epsilon. Well, with quadratics, we're probably very familiar with factoring. Uh, with absolute value, we just keep the absolute values around each factor. So x squared is x times x. And if we do a minus 2 and a minus 1, we're completely factored. 
What's nice here is that we've got the x minus 2 that we know is less than delta. So we're going to be able to say this is less than something times delta. But we need to know what to do with the x minus 1 bit. This is where it's going to take a little creativeness. How we're going to get to that creativeness is we're going to play with the algebra on x minus 2 is less than delta. And the fact that we said delta is going to be at most 1. It's the minimum of 1 and something else. Let's see. We're going to play off to the side here. I guess I'll put it underneath. The absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta. But delta is no bigger than 1. If the absolute value is less than a number, what that really means is that the x minus 2 is between negative 1 and positive 1. We want to know what to do with the x minus 1. So we're going to try and change this middle stuff to become x minus 1. To get x minus 2 to become x minus 1, we're going to add 1. Of course, if we add 1 there, we have to add 1 to all three parts. And when we do, we get 0 is less than x minus 1, which is less than 2. Now we're going to change this back to an absolute value statement, that the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than something. And we can either say the absolute value is less than 0 or less than 2. We always will take the most extreme value, because we want to be less than. We want to keep epsilon as small as possible. So we'll take the worst case scenario and say, worst case scenario, the 2 is more extreme. So the worst case scenario, the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 2. That is what we're going to multiply delta by. Because x minus 2, x minus 1, worst case scenario is 2. x minus 2. Worst case scenario is delta. So at least we know that the absolute value of x minus 2 times x minus 1 is less than 2 times delta. And now we know what to do with the epsilon. Epsilon divided by 2, the reciprocal of the 2, because it's multiplied by delta, to make the rest of the proof work. We have 2 times delta, which is epsilon over 2. 2's divide out, and we're just left with epsilon. And we're done because we've said that the function minus the limit is less than epsilon. So we can now say we're done. QED quid erum demonstratum. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but you don't know Latin, so you can't prove me wrong. Let's do one more quadratic, because these take a little bit more trying to manipulate that second factor in order to figure out what our delta is going to equal. So let's prove that the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 2x squared minus x plus 1 is equal to 4. Again, identifying the pieces, x is approaching our a. The function is what we're taking the limit of. And the answer, that is l, our limit. The first three statements of our proof are pretty prescribed to us. Let epsilon be greater than 0. We will choose a delta that's equal to we don't know exactly what it equals yet, but we do know because this is a quadratic, we're going to do the minimum of 1 and something, the reciprocal of whatever delta is multiplied by. And then we assume the absolute value of x minus 
our a, or what x is approaching, minus negative 1 means plus 1 is less than delta. Now our algebra step, the function 2x squared minus x plus 1 minus the limit of 4. A little bit of cleanup, the absolute value of 2x squared minus x minus 3. Hopefully, we can work with this and say it is ultimately less than epsilon. Well, we know we can factor it, 2x and x. Um, to kind of help my factoring, I know I'm ultimately going to try and get an x plus 1. So hopefully, that x is an x plus 1, which means the other one's probably a minus 3. And when I check that out, it does work. Plus 2 minus 3 is the minus 1. Nice. That's what we wanted. Now we have the x plus 1 that we like. We know that's less than delta, but we have to figure out what delta is multiplied by. So we need to play with the 2x minus 3. Using what we assume, so kind of off to the side in our work, we assumed. Going back to that assumption statement, we assume that x plus 1 is less than delta, which worst case scenario, it's going to be a 1, the absolute value. So we remove the absolute values by saying that's between positive 1 and negative 1. And then we want to massage this so that it looks like 2x minus 3, so we can figure out how extreme our situation is. I recommend doing the 2x part first. So we get it to equal, we get the 2x by multiplying by 2 on all three parts. Make sure we distribute. So we get negative 2 is less than 2x plus 2, which is less than 2. Buy us a little more whiteboard space. We want it to have a minus 3, 2x minus 3. Right now it's plus 2. So to get that to be minus 3, we need to subtract 5. 2 minus 5 will be the minus 3. So we subtract 5 from all three parts. And we get negative 7 is less than 2x minus 3, which is less than negative 3. Changing it back to an absolute value expression, 2x minus 3 is less than. And then we pick the most extreme case. So we're always ready for a worst case scenario. This time, the most extreme case is on the right side, 7 being more extreme than the 3. And positive, because we're talking about absolute value. So 2x minus 3 is less than 7. That is what is being multiplied by our delta, which also tells us the reciprocal means divide by 7. So our delta is epsilon over 7. So we have 7 times delta, which is epsilon over 7. The 7's divide out, and we're just left with epsilon. So we've shown that f of x minus l is less than epsilon, which QED is what we wanted, that which was to be demonstrated. So that is your general proof for uh, limit. We're just going to work with linear examples and quadratic examples in this class. You can take more advanced classes if you really want to prove a whole bunch of delta epsilons. But you should be very familiar with how to set up the proof. Always let epsilon be greater than 0. Choose a delta equal to something. And then assume that x minus a is less than delta. And then ultimately, we play with f of x minus l. I'll put it on top. That f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And if you do that, you've got a perfect delta epsilon proof. Practice a few of these. We will see you in class where we can talk more about these proofs in more detail.